dear audience, colleagues, friends, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. So I have one simple goal for the next 15 to 20 minutes. I, I really want to show you how we did redesign large parts of Swisscom to make it ready for AI. It's not a simple task. Swisscom is a, from my perspective, perspective a rather large company. It has 17,000 employees. It's over 100 years old. It makes about, it makes more than 11 billion of revenues. So it was a tough journey. And I want to share some of these lessons learned with you. And if some of you are right in the midst of really scaling your AI startup, even your research projects, or in charge of redesigning your company for AI, I'm super happy to share these lessons learned also in discussions. So let me start with a few quotes. We all know there have been significant breakthroughs in AI. We have Joshua Benicio saying, breakthroughs in deep learning, speech recognition came in 2010, compute division in 2012. Then we had breakthroughs in machine translation. Then we have, I think it's Sir Jeffrey Hinton now, saying this cannot be a hype. It's in your smartphone. It's how you compute to make sure that they can recognize things. And it's how machine translation works. So you see this is really happening. And the final quote, one of, one of my favorite, is a probe in StarCraft II playing against Alpha Star saying, enemy, enemy fire ahead, taking fire, kaboom. This happened last week. So we see this is really happening. Now, several companies are really in the midst of this race for AI. And here we see really two categories. We see companies, let's say the hyperscalers, the the AI tech companies, the Googles, Microsoft, AWSs, that are showing significant pro progress. But we also have companies like Swisscom, ABB, Novartis, Roche, who are really changing their business models, how they run tech, how they do architecture, in order to adapt AI. And four years ago, I joined Swisscom with the one task of making it ready for AI. Now, this has been the work of a lot of people. It has been very challenging, and I will also share with you our personal story on how we did this. Now, Swisscom, big company, its main asset is networking infrastructure. It has a pretty big consumer business, an enterprise business. So not a lot of people know this, but Swisscom is actually also the largest IT provider, Swiss IT provider. Now, how did we do this? This is literally, literally one of the first pictures of my first week at work. By the way, it's only four years old. I did make it black and white too. That looks a little bit more dramatic. <laughs> this was four years ago. And this is how it looks today. So today we have over 300 people that work on data, work on analytics, work on AI. And it became this huge organization that is really making the company ready for AI. So how did we get there? What did we do? So we were tasked to align AI activities across units. And as many companies, we have these big units who kind of work like silos. And when we started, we looked at the different units and we saw that a lot, a lot of pieces of the puzzle were actually there. So you had some units that had a strategy for how to handle data, big data and AI. You had certain projects that were already using machine learning for, for speech recognition. You had different teams doing analytics, and you had a lot of teams working on infrastructure. So the important thing was that a lot, a lot of elements, let's call them nuggets, were there. But our challenge was really on how can we align this? Now, what was really important for us is we knew that if we want to align these activities in such a large company, we have to take ownership of the entire AI value creation. This means we need to be able to influence how infrastructure works, how we collect data, how we apply AI, how we do research, venturings, how we can define our offerings and product checks, and how we do strategy. And actually, what we have today is we no longer have only those silos. We have a horizontal organization that is taking care of all of these activities, and that is maintaining one central data lake. That is our one source of truth for all the data. Now, I'm pretty sure that some members of the audience will be facing this task as well. And now, looking back, we took kind of like five steps to get there, and I really want to share them with you. So first, it's business alignment, identifying assets for transformation, 
taking care of the organizational design, really investing in people and culture, mastering data curation infrastructure. So the first really important thing that we had to do was business alignment. And coming out of research, I realized that this is not as easy to do as one thinks. Because the first talk that I had with the executive management, I was like, OK, this is my toolbox. This is everything I learned in school. This is what comes out of research. And we should do method A, use technology B, redesign the infrastructure in a certain way. And they just looked at me and were like, I don't know how we're going to do this. So the important thing for us was really first listen to what are the biggest problems that the company faces and that we should solve. This was the most important step. For Swisscom, this was obviously making sure that its network and infrastructure run properly. Why? Swisscom invests about one and a half billion per year to build this network. And building this network takes time, it takes resources, and if you do it, you want to do it right. Just to give you an example, I mean, some of the infrastructure is located on the highest mountains of, of Switzerland. It's, there are cables, infrastructures, even down in some of the lakes. So if you invest money, you want to invest it in the right ways. And even some of the work that has to be done is quite dangerous. So one of the first core areas that we had to focus on was really use AI and ML for rollout and improvement planning, anomaly detection, and predictive maintenance. And this was also a pretty challenging task for our infrastructure because we had to make sure that we have the appropriate infrastructure to, to stream about two million of events per second to do the monitoring, to do the analysis, and so forth. A second one that was really important for us was AI for market offerings. So how can we use advances in deep learning to make sure that our products and services are the best on the market? And one of my favorite examples here is oh, Swisscom TV. It was the first TV platform in Switzerland where you could just push a button and say what you want to watch in 26 different dialects, and it works. A second one that was also very important for us was AI for customer interaction and support. Now, the challenge that we have here is that when people call us or when people send us an email, they're usually not happy. Usually they call us because something is not working. Now, of course, this doesn't happen a lot, but when they call us, we better make sure that we take their concerns and their problems serious. So what we did here is we really use AI and machine learning to triage all of the incoming communication. And the interesting thing is here, this is not just emails, chats, uh, or phone calls. Also, 15% of the incoming messages are handwritten letters. And of those, you also take care of using AI and machine learning. And also, one interesting example is agent advisory. So every time you call a Swisscom hotline, the agent that talks to you has a system based on machine learning that is showing him what's the appropriate solution for the problem you are just telling to the agent. And I can tell you, rolling out an AI system that is supposed to help agents, it's not the th same thing as just rolling out another CRM or another ERP. Because I was in the first session when we went to those agents and we told them, listen, now you will have an AI-based system that will help you to solve customer problems. And in the next six weeks, we need you to train that system so that it has most of your knowledge in its engine. This session did not last very long. So it's challenging. Now, second step, find the assets for transformation. And what I want to highlight here is you need to find and recruit the experts. This is not easy. So you have to find them in-house, and you have to recruit them. Now, some of the learnings that we did is we really tried to, for the first hirees, find people in academia that had a very good network. Because the, 50 in, the 50, 51st engineers that we hired, really experts in AI and machine learning, they didn't answer to our official job postings. They all, come, they all came through the network. And then the second thing what we also had to take care of, it's absolutely fantastic to have all those great AI research engineers, but we really needed people that were able to lead in agile structures or that I have the seniority to really pull the job through. So those were the two main challenges. Then, choose the right organizational design. 
So make sure you choose an organizational design that fits your company, that really helps you to get the job done that you want to do. But also what I want to highlight here is adopt agile ways of working. So for our organization, we fully adopted the SAFE uh, framework, so Scrum of Scrum. This really helped us having over 300 people really syncing up their activities, increasing transparency, having one unified backlog, and especially the common rituals that really helped us to get the job done. So here are some images of the people meeting up for a PI planning every 10 weeks, syncing their activities, doing the planning together, and really aligning what's going on over the whole organization. And by the way, it's way easier to manage your dependencies if you have your people once every couple of weeks meeting and then not having to go from one meeting to another or to, from one office to the other to manage their dependencies. People and culture. Master already told us education is super important for me, so we made the commitment that out of these 17,000 people, we will educate over 1,000 people in using the new ways of data and AI together with EPFL. But also what I want to highlight here is research. So before we started, there was kind of this mindset at Swisscom of let's just give somebody money to do research and then see what comes out of this. We changed this completely. We set up a new strategy where we said, OK, we're going to build labs on the campuses of the different schools. And the first one, the first one that we opened was actually a digital lab here at EPFL three years ago. We said we want to have a permanent home base on these campuses. We want to have a framework agreement. We want to have master and PhD students working with our teams and publishing these results. And this has just been a mind-blowing experience for us because it allowed us to do technology transfer more faster, and it actually helped us to really attract new people. And today, if you look at Switzerland, we have uh, research engagements with EPFL, ETH, uh, University of Zurich, Bern, EDIAP in Martigny, and this really helped us to, to bring the benefits of research closer to the company. Then, last step, curate data and master infrastructure. So, uh, three things. First of all, we really had to push, put enormous energy into making sure that all of our data flows into a central data lake. How did we do this? We had to establish new architectural guidelines for the whole company, making sure that every master system that we have somewhere in the organization is required to put its data into the central data lake. This was big task that we had to solve in order to make sure that we have the right data to train our models. Also, data governance and security is super important. And also, one thing that I want to mention here is hybrid infrastructure. Swisscom has been on a long time on a way to just say, hey, all the infrastructure that we need, we're going to build it ourselves. And now we have a shift here saying for the on-premise stuff that, is super, that needs to be super secure, we're going to do this ourselves. But there's so much going on in terms of AI services that one could leverage from the clouds and hyperscalers. So we changed our modus operandi from just on-prem to a hybrid infrastructure where we can really leverage the best of both worlds. Now, to close, so our five steps, what we did in the, co in the course of four years, how we scaled to a few, from a few puzzle pieces to an entire organization doing an AI, and so my question is, will you be redesigning companies for AI? And let me, let me finish by just saying three things. I think what we do here is of utmost importance. And personally, if you ask me, the, the leaders of tomorrow, they don't sit in fancy hotels or meeting rooms in Davos. I think they sit in the workshop shops of AMLD. The second thing is, this thing takes so much energy and it's such a, a troubling ride that you can only do it as a team. So you need your band to succeed. And the third thing is this journey is far from over. So we fixed it for a portion of the company, but now we have to scale it to really make sure that everybody can benefit from this. And only if you make sure that every employee can benefit from AI, you will make in the end sure that your customers feel this benefits. So with these three statements, I'd like to close. Thank you so much for your time, and I'd be super happy to meet you guys later for chatting or having coffee. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Michael. Just one question before you leave. Um, so you said you started this four years ago? Yes. So if you could go back to yourself four years ago <laughs> and give this one advice to yourself, what would it be? So I would actually say, um, man, that's such a difficult question. I would say, I have a backlog of a thousand things. <laughs> well, I would say, I mean, just keep up the energy and maybe <laughs> sleep a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, good. All Thank right. you so much. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.